Can you see the sailboat? Are you faster than Walt Flanagan's dog? Say, would you like a chocolate covered pretzel? This is Mall Rats with Kevin Smith on Collider Movie Club. What's up, everyone? Welcome back to a new edition of Collider Movie Club, brought to you by Movies Anywhere and specifically Screen Pass, where you can go watch Mall Rats and share it with your friends right now. Look who we have with us today. We got Kevin Smith here. And who better to talk about this movie than this guy right here? I know a thing or two about Mall Rats, kids. I am one of the foremost authorities of Mall Rats in this world. I'm not good at much, but I can tell you about Mall Rats. I am so excited to talk with Kevin and Coy about Mall Rats. But before we get started, I need to let you know that this episode is brought to you by Movies Anywhere, presenting Screen Pass. Movies Anywhere is a great service for digital collectors that brings you your favorite movies together into one library, no matter where you purchase them. And now with Screen Pass, you can give your friends access to your favorite movie without them ever leaving your collection. With over 7,000 eligible titles, Screen Pass is a unique game changer for sharing your love of movies with others. So go on, create a free account today at MoviesAnywhere.com. Now, I've seen this movie probably more times than is socially acceptable to say, and I watched it yesterday for the unknown time, and I'd never noticed that not only is Ben Affleck Buttman, but it's the Frank Miller Batman symbol that he adorns on his chest as Zack Snyder's Batman to this day. What was the conversation like when your prick from Pashable Mail became Buttman in real life? Uh, it was nuts. I remember I was here in the house, went down to my bedroom where Jennifer is, my wife. And she was like, uh, they just cast Ben as Batman. I was like, no, they didn't. There's no way on earth that he would do Batman. He already did Daredevil and he just got like Academy Award buzz for Argo. They won awards. So like, there's no way. And then she turned her laptop and there on Pod Reporters, Ben Affleck cast as Batman. I was like, holy crap. The last time I'd spoken to him before he went off to Batman, he was shooting Gone Girl. So he was like, as soon as I'm done doing Fincher's movie, I'll come do a podcast with you. And then I didn't see him for years until we made Jane Silent Bob reboot and stuff. So I never really talked about it much with him until he got to Jane Silent Bob reboot. And then at that point, it was so far in his rear view that he was willing like to do, you know, Martha jokes, <laughs> which, which I was always pleased by. When we were making the movie, like he certainly wasn't butt man. That was only when we were doing the, like the credits, like at the end, when we had gone to the San Diego Comic-Con circa 1995, showed the movie at Horton Plaza to like, you know, 200 Comic-Con fans. We had met a lot of uh, comic book artists at that screening. And so we started collecting them and reaching out to them about doing this opening title sequence because the movie they watched didn't have the comic book covers and the credits and stuff just had a title card and then the movie began so that san diego comic-con screening allowed us to get like a joe quesada and jimmy palmiot everybody who did covers came from our connections at that screening mall red screen so as the credits rolled for me, my experience, the sec the new Snyder trailer dropped in that moment. So I literally wrapped my experience and then saw Ben get to some new frames as Batman. And 25 years, what a crazy difference the, the cinematic landscape makes. It is nuts, man. Like I had seen it when I was a kid in the 90s, basically living in a mall and then coming back to it as, as an older adult now. And Decades later. There, there is still something about mall culture. I feel like this is why I love just about any movie set in a mall. There is something about seeing those kinds of visuals and tapping into that just like obsessive nature with the way a mall is structured and how it's not a mall, it is the mall because that is how I refer to my mall and I still do. I don't really know what, you know, teen culture in malls is like at this point, but I can't imagine this movie ever being made the same way today when everyone's walking around the mall like like this the entire time it's just not the same yeah and also kids don't tend to pack up like they used to most of their interactions are online so it's i mean particularly obviously during the quarantine but even prior to that it wasn't like you know hey let's go hang out at the mall like they just all pretty much hang out online at this point so yeah it'd be 
weird to pull off a mall movie at this point. Uh, we're going to try next year, Twilight of the Mall Rats. We're going to make a sequel to Mall Rats, but it, it's that's pretty much about how the malls are dying anyway. That's kind of a big integral part of the plot. All the teen movies eventually hit the mall, like for at least a scene. And that's something that I guess nowadays kids look at the same way we looked at like when I was growing up, we'd watch Happy Days and they all went to you know, the, the, a sock op or, or Al's diner, you know, the, uh, for, to get food and stuff and hang out. And, you know, we'd watch those shows and be like, ugh, the 50s. Nobody does that anymore. Kids will be watching those mall movies now, seeing kids hanging out in the 80s, 70s, 80s, and 90s at malls and be like, my God, what an antiquated notion. Like, it's so strange to be a part of dead culture at this point you know i, I, I that makes it, me sad or not like my my bat mitzvah theme was perry's plaza and every single table was a different store from the mall that's genius man um yeah that, that won't happen anymore ain't no bat mitzvahs being mall themed in, in 2021 for sure when i was a kid i could you know like make pop culture references to like literally everything that had existed and now that would be impossible to do because i can't consume everything that exists you know how many how many seasons are they in on stranger things this is going into four coming up on four i still haven't seen season one watched one episode and i was like i'm gonna get back to it and then got inundated by a bunch of other content and then all of a sudden season two dropped and then season three so like i i'm i can't even lay claim to having the same superpowers that i had in 1995 where i was like i'm a master of pop culture now I'm like, oh, I've heard of that, but I haven't seen it yet. But now we're drowning in content. So it's really hard to keep up. Hence, really hard for me, at least, I can't speak to others, to be the voice of pop culture anymore. I'm just a voice in pop culture. Whereas 20 years ago, you know, I was the one that was like trading in pop culture. I've learned that like I trade in the nostalgia sector of our media. Like everything I'm involved with is predicated on something that happened once before. So in some cases it's sequels like Twilight of the Mallrats. In some cases like Masters of the Universe or the Green Hornet cartoon, it's me dealing with IP and property that have existed for a long time. There's two other projects I'm working on that we haven't announced yet that are also like just infused with IP that's been around for a while and whatnot. And so somewhere in my career, I went from being the, the person who says new things to the person who is just wrapped in nostalgia. That seems to be my corner of the world at, at this point. I'm certainly not the only one. A lot of people trade in it and stuff. But most of the work I do now, I find is predicated in, in the past. Um, and, you know, I, I guess if you would ask me in the beginning of my career, like, would that have scared me or is that something I'd worry about? I don't know if I'd have an answer. I'd be like, I don't know, maybe. But now being in it, like, I don't mind it. And it wasn't until 10 years into Mallrat's life when people forgot that it was a box office flop and that critics didn't like it. And they had just watched it over and over on cable or on VHS or whatever that, you know, I, I started to see the tide turn. It's weird to be the person who is like, Oh, I know the story. The story's written. We made mall rats and nobody liked it. And that's the end of the story. And mall rats was part of my mythology as a cautionary tale. He almost lost it all with mall rats, but chasing Amy brought him back. And then 10 years after mall rats, the thinking changed, which was mind bending because you spend so much time going, no, I'm bad. I'm bad. You don't understand. I'm bad. I was told I'm bad. I'm bad. And then all of a sudden you start meeting the real audience. Like they didn't go see it when we, it was playing in theaters. Um, but it doesn't mean that the audience didn't exist and they eventually found the flick. And, and of course they found it at home. Like that's where we all were. Brody and everyone like him, like spent a lot of time indoors, you know, and they don't necessarily go out to that kind of movie. You know, they go out to bigger blockbuster movies. Like they go to the movies that Brody and all his friends talked about and stuff like that. So there were ways into the movie, but just not conventional ways, not the way that like, you know, you put it out in a movie theater and everybody goes sees it on opening weekend and it's a success and it keeps going and blah, blah, blah. It was something that got found later on. And I didn't even believe in it. Like that's the crazy thing is like Mallrats is the movie now that buoys my career. Like, you know, it's the one that makes me seem smart from 25 years ago, even though it's a dumbass movie. I made a movie predicated on the past. Mallrats is also 
nostalgic. It's a movie that looks back to the movies I grew up on. For example, the John Hughes movies or the more antic John Landis movies and stuff like that. So even as I was making it, it was a movie that was predicated in something old and, you know, time makes everything new. Like I remember Jim Jacks, who was a producer on Mallrats, he turned out to be very true. Time proved him right. He goes, we weren't wrong to make this movie. We were just early. He's going, happens all the time. He's going, you'll see, this movie is gonna age incredibly well. When people find this movie, they're absolutely gonna love it. We weren't wrong. Don't think you were wrong. And you know, it's goofy, it's simple, it's easy. I think why people like it so much is because as you watch Mallrats, you're like, I could have made this movie. And you could have, you know, the guy who made it wasn't very talented. He was the audience. That's why people like that movie and relate to it because it was made by somebody who normally sits in the audience. It wasn't made by a filmmaker where you can see, oh, clearly this is somebody born to do this sort of thing. He or her know exactly how to tell a story in a visual medium and stuff. Instead, this just felt like a movie that was made by somebody who likes movies an awful lot. There's no pretense about it. Like most movies have a pretense about them where you're like, this is important. We're about to watch a movie. It doesn't matter what it is. Even if it's like a superhero movie, it's like they spent a lot of money. So they present it. This movie, even while it was being made, it was important to the filmmaker, but the filmmaker knew that it would be important to people that liked comic books. You know, my first two movies back to back is like one set in a convenience store um, that like mimicked or mirrored my life at the time. And the second one was one set in a mall, which mirrored my teenage years you know that's not like groundbreaking filmmaking that's not like hey it's set in space and there are wookies like that's imaginative making a mall movie like i literally pitched mall rats to jim jacks you know i met him at the sundance film festival we just won the filmmaker trophy for clerks and john pearson is like this is jim jacks i was like i know who this guy is you made days confused man you made tombstone and tremors and stuff and he was like yeah yeah he's going oh, i loved your mall uh, your clerks movie i almost bought it what do you want to do next? And I said, um, I want to do a movie called Mall Rats. And he goes, what is that? And I said, it's clerks, but in a mall. And he goes, oh, that sounds good. I want to do that. He's going, when you get out to California, come to the Black Tower and you pitch it to me at Universal. But he, for better or for worse, was the shepherd of Mall Rats. He was uh, the person that, as I wrote it, I would fax him scenes to read because we didn't, we couldn't just email it. We didn't even have that at that point. He was the guy I sent him the scene that became the Stan Lee scene, where Brody is talking to a comic book guru, who I believe was called Frank Lee. And he goes, who's this comic book guy? He's going, this reads like the, the scene in uh, American Graffiti, where Dickie Dreyfus meets Wolfman Jack. He's going, who is this guy meant to be? I said, oh, he's not a real guy. He's just like, you know, imagine if he was a comic book rock star, kind of like Stan Lee. And he goes, why don't you just write it for Stan Lee? And I said, well, I don't know Stan Lee. He goes, I do. He met with Stan every month at Dan Tanis to have a dinner because Jim Jacks was a huge fan. He'd been doing this since the late eighties. First thing I hear is, hey, this is Stan Lee. I said, I know who this is. Oh, I know that voice anywhere, man. I, I watched every episode of Spider-Man as Amazing Friends, but a huge fan for years, man. I know all your work. So glad Jim put us in touch with one another. He's going, let's talk about your movie. Very flattered that you want me to be in it. He's going, but I have a bit of an issue before I could say yes. I was like, all right. And he goes, in your movie, you have a scene where I'm talking about the girl that got away. He's a very touching scene, really wonderful. He's going, however, if I play myself in a movie and talk about the girl that got away, the girl I got at home will lock me out of the house. So what are we going to do about this? I can't hurt Joni's feelings. Like Joni's only always been the only one. So I can't go into a movie and say that like I, there was some other girl before Joni. I got, got a suggestion. I said, okay. He goes, what if there's another scene where like I tell his friend that I was only kidding and that way everybody knows that I, I you know, I could tell the story, but I didn't have some other girl that got away before I met Joni. And I was like, I, I will do what everyone, I could totally, absolutely do that. That is adorable. I, I look at you thinking about your wife's feelings in this dopey ass movie. I was like, uh, of course I could do that. And I always thought that was incredibly sweet and that he was such a loving husband. And then I got to know Stan over the years and I was right, it was very sweet. And he was a very loving husband. You wanna be loved as much in this life as Stan Lee loved his wife, Joan. But Stan Lee, also one of the most strategic people I've ever met in my life. No dumb man, very smart cookie. And what he did in asking for another scene to explain himself to some other character 
was he got another scene in the movie simply by being like, shouldn't there be another scene where I explain that I'm kidding? I'm like, well, of course, of course there'll be another scene. Like that. Stan. Hi. Hey. hey, you know, I think he bought it. Yeah? yeah? Yeah. What kind of story did you give him? Oh, it was the vulture soliloquy, you know, from the Spider-Man anniversary issue. Love, be a vulture tonight. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, I can't thank you enough, Mr. Oh, forget it. But, you know, I think you ought to get him some help. He seems to be really hung up on superhero sex organs. But I'll you'll outgrow it. Yeah. Okay. Oh, Mr. Lee. Yeah. Excelsior. Oh, you got that right. See ya. We'll be back with more with Kevin in a minute. But I do want to remind everyone that this show is brought to you by Screen Pass, presented by Movies Anywhere. With Movies Anywhere, you can give your friends access to your personal collection and let them experience this insane view askew film for themselves without it ever having to leave your digital library. Movies Anywhere has over 7,000 eligible Screen Pass titles. So get started today at MoviesAnywhere.com. Jim was the facilitator who got Stan uh, to me, and he was the dude who was the, the biggest believer in Mallrats, Mr. Mallrats himself. Um, he passed away going on, I guess, about six years ago, man. Heading into the church, and I'm like, this guy, he, he gave it all for film, and nobody was going to be here for him. I walked in, the church it literally packed. It's like a scene out of a movie. I can't even sit down. It's packed. Like, I'm leaning on a wall in the back. And who is the first person I see sitting midway up the, the um, aisle to the altar? sitting right on the left, on the right side, uh, on the far side of the pew, is Sam Raimi. I said, Sam, when I was hanging out with Jim, Jim would take me and Scott to like Dan Tannis, and he would tell us stories about working with you, with the Coen brothers, with Billy Bob Thornton and stuff like that. But he would regale us with tales about working with you, like, like you were one of his closest friends. We heard him say your name so often, we were like, yeah, I'm sure you're friends with Sam Raimi. And yet, Clearly you guys were friends. I was like, so that meant the world to me that you were here. And then afterwards, the guy stops me, younger filmmaker. And he goes, I just want you to know, me and my friends did the same thing for the last like three years. I was like, what? And he was like, yeah, he still had those dinners, man. He'd sit around and regale us with stories about making the movie, just like he told you all the stories about, you know, Sam Raimi and stuff. And I was like, get out of here. That's crazy. That's awesome, man. And he goes, the only difference is in our dinners, the only filmmaker he ever talked about was you. Anytime I eat with Jim Jacks, I knew that I was gonna hear Kevin Smith's story. So I just want you to know that the way that he talked about Sam Raimi uh, to you was the way he talked about you to us. And then I felt a profound sense of loss because I was like, man, like I should have called him up and taken him to see some Marvel movies. Jim Jacks went to see literally every movie that came out. I know there were times where I went to see Marvel movies by myself and I realized that like I could have rang him up because he went to the movies by himself all the time. We could have seen those flicks together and shit like that. Broke my heart. Um, so when I think about Mallrats, I think about Jim because he was such an integral part of it. And I feel so bad because when a movie flops, like everyone just wants to get as far away from failure as possible because this business is all about the next thing and the next thing and the next thing. So I felt bad because I was definitely one of those people. I was like selling out on my own kid. Could you imagine you make a movie? It's like having a kid of your own. You're creative. Can you imagine having a kid, so to speak, and then ignoring that kid for like 10 years because other people didn't like it, even though you loved it. Like that's how I grew as a storyteller and as a person, man. And with mall rats, we didn't get any acceptance when we first come out the gate. Nobody, like no critics were in our corner. It came and went like a, like a fart in an elevator. Nobody wanted to talk about it. Like Jim said, like we, we didn't make a mistake. We were just early. Um, you know, so I don't know. That's what I think of when I think of mall rides. I know you didn't even I, ask I, that, sorry. Yes, that answered a myriad of questions that I had written down to get to because what a journey. The journey of this movie feels like the journey the movie itself has gone on. All of the characters self-actualize. I know you give yourself a lot of crap about your characters not having arcs, but I would argue Brody realizes how to use his humor. We have characters get out from under their fathers. We have people, the movie self-actualizes and then the movie itself has now self-actualized by way of him being Stan Lee and Captain Marvel. It's self-actualized to a multiple universe level. Arguably this movie's arc is the character's arc. Where do you take those characters for another one when you've achieved some insane meta zeitgeist shift like the 25 year Mallrats journey? It's an interesting question because I, the first version of a Mallrats sequel that I've written years ago, 
was not technically a mall rat sequel it had all the characters in it and it took place in a mall but it was predicated on an old promise i'd made to jim jacks we were on set making the movie and he was like this movie's going to do well and this and the universal is probably going to ask for a sequel and i was like really he goes you got an idea i said yes he said what is it i says mall rats 2 die hard in a mall i said we just do die hard but brody is like john mcclain he's got to save the mall and Jim was like, oh my God, that's great. We'll do that. Because they were doing like diehard movies like crazy back then. That was 1995. So when I was like, I'm going to make a Mallrat sequel like a couple of years ago, that's the sequel I wrote. And that's the one we were intending to make. I'm not going to make it anymore. Number one, we hacked up that script and the whole third act became Jay and Silent Bob reboot. Um, but also that script was so like, I remember reading it before I started the new version of Twi like what became Twilight of the Mallrats. And thinking if I was a Mallrats fan and I was like, I've loved this movie for 25 years and he's made another one. And I walked in and I watched Die Hard with all my characters from Mallrats. I'd be like, clearly the author didn't understand Mallrats to begin with. Like it was a fluke. We all knew that. So the new version, uh, the one that we'll be shooting, Twilight of the Mallrats, is literally a beat for beat facsimile of Mallrats. And it's Brody and his daughter. Uh, fuel the adventure. A guy who lives for the mall and lives at the mall and uh, his daughter who's like, this shouldn't exist. In the current draft, I wove COVID into it as well because the, the world is going to be forever marked and scarred by that. I remember like when I was telling people, I'm going to do a new draft and work COVID into the script. They're like, don't do that. That's going to pass. I'm like, <laughs> no, it's not. And clearly it's still here with us. So that has to be an active part of the script, which also helps out with the budget because that means you go from having like a hundred extras to like, well, 20 will be fine, you know, very sp and very spaced out. You talk about nostalgia, like you're falling back on something here, but that's the exciting opportunity that having so much of your career based in nostalgia affords you now is that you can tackle the same story in a sense, but add more to the conversation, something that you didn't have access to way back then. It's true. And thank you for noticing that. If you live long enough, you could tell the same story again and be like, but this time I'm doing it from this angle. I made a thing. So if I want to break a thing, I could break a thing because I made that thing. But I wouldn't want to do that with somebody else's stuff. Like Masters of the Universe, it's not my IP, but like you should see how Fabergé egg-like we handled the material, man. Because we're all like Marvel fans. Everyone on me and writing kids like Eric and Dia and Mark and Tim uh, on my writing crew. Like we, we all love the Marvel movies and stuff. And we're like, you know, one of the things you love about them is how reverently they treat the stories you grew up reading, the IP, the characters that you know and love and stuff. So as we headed into Masters of the Universe, I was like, that's what we're doing. We're not breaking it to reinvent it or be like, this ain't your dad's Masters of the Universe. This is literally your dad's Masters of the Universe. And that's how you handle somebody else's toys. But if I want to be like disruptive or if I want to get experimental, if I want to do something like, let me see if I can make mall rats again, but better, especially now seeing what mall rats has, has become like it would have been way less risky to make a mall rat sequel, like 10 years after the movie came out. And as long as I'm like doing it with my stuff, nobody could complain, but don't worry. I'll never let it break. If you were a comic book character, what character would you be? Wow. That's a great question. Tough one, though. I mean, what does one gauge his response on? Physical prowess, keen detection skills, the ability to banter well with supervillains. How's your comic book collection, Brody? Oh, it's going good, but I've been... Oh, comics? What are you talking about, lady? I don't collect comics. Comics are for kids. I knew it. Suitor number one, you, you just don't know when to quit, do you? No. No, but you sure do. Well, I thought you were in love. I was, but you complicated my life. How so? Well, you, you, you placed me in such a damned uncomfortable position with my father. Twice even. What was I supposed to do? Show a little backbone? I was ready to show a little backbone. And then you had to show up with Bumbler the Boy Wonder over there and, and screw things up further, proving, proving that you never took the situation seriously. Boy Wonder? I'm all man, lady. In the beginning, when I made Clerks, it was about like, hey, anybody could do this shit. And then people see that over the course of 26 years and other movies, of course, and go, yeah, I could do that stuff. And so in a weird way, you sign your own death warrant in this business by inspiring others to sing their song, which is all I care about, right? Like if everyone 
could be creative and sure be a much better and happier world and stuff. Everyone would feel fulfilled. So that's the mission. And it was the mission early on with all the movies I created. You just want other people to do the same thing. And then other people do the same thing and then start doing far better things. And then you have to actually worry about your livelihood in the business. And that's always also not completely true because that's only one aspect of the business. Like if you're going for money from somebody that's got it, like studio money or network money and stuff, they can never stop you from making your art. They can never stop you from self-expression. Like, you know, I'm, I'm a guy who made his first movie for like two bucks. So if needs be one day, I'll go back to making movies for two bucks and have done very similar things since then and whatnot. But you can't expect to always be J.J. Uh, Abrams. I mean, I'm sure J.J. Abrams always expects to be J.J. J. J. Abrams. And I'm sure Chris Nolan always expects to be Chris Nolan and whatnot. And I guess if you've, you know, you work consistent blockbusters and always deliver, you can have that role. But there's always somebody far more inventive, somebody far more creative, some voice that chances are you may have had a hand in inspiring to go and sing their song. And they come in and kind of take over. But it doesn't mean you can't do your shit. Like, you know, nobody in the world, I assure you, was looking for a Jay and Silent Bob Strike Back sequel. Didn't stop me from making one. Like, at the end of the day, if I can pull the means together and I, I'm passionate about it, go forward. Like, that's how we got here in the first place. I didn't make clerks going like, well, Warner Brothers gave me $27,000, so now I can do my art. Like, I just did it. I didn't wait for permission. So since I love it so much, I'm not doing it because I'm like, oh, it's a money job. I'm doing it out of a sense of like love, out of a sense of like, oh my God, imagine if we could pull this off, a sense of adventure and a sense, oddly enough, of ambition, even though some people wouldn't think it's ambitious to make another mall rats or something like that. But I've put enough time between the first one and this one. And you know, the heart attack a couple of years ago might be enough to put me over the top where people are like, well, he wants to make a mall rat sequel. Let's we'll stand by and see how it is and shit. And then it's up to me, I hope that people will give the shit I make a shot. But I also know there's so much other content out there that like, chances are they might not even know if a Mallrats movie comes out. But if they see it, I, I'm, I'm gonna make sure that they're gonna be like, good. There's a lot of it that is similar, uh, I, a lot of me that is similar. And so I wanna see if I can get close while making something completely different. That sounds exciting. That sounds like the kind of risk you should be taking with your baby. <laughs> If I was smart, I'd risk it on somebody else's baby and keep my baby safe. But if you're going to experiment with children, experiment with your own children, I guess. And so um, here we are trying to make a mall rat sequel. I guess that right there is the lesson of this edition of Collider Movie Club. You know, run with it as you please, I guess. Kevin, I feel like we could have done this for hours and hours, but we got to wind it down. Thank you so much for your time today and for joining us. God, no worries. Thanks for having. Sorry, I talked so much. No, Kevin, as, as a kid that grew up, and we've talked about this, admiring Brody Bruce and then realizing his snark, I cannot wait to see this heartfelt Mallrats 2, uh, the scene with Ben and Reboot, like that in a Mallrats movie is going to change my life already. Sight unseen. I'm so excited, man. Let me tell you something. We go back and we make that movie next year. You're in it for sure, Coy. Like, yeah, I know, Barry, you're more than welcome, but I know Coy, it's religion to him. So I'm going to get you in there, man. And then... If the movie sucks, you're taking the heat with me. I'm with you. I'm we'll gonna go share the blame. I'm gonna be like, what was different this time? <laughs> Koi, that's the difference. Blame him. And I'll be over there making a Chasing Amy sequel. I'll <laughs> write the article about that. It's all Please do. Please do. <laughs> All right, guys, thank you so much for watching this edition of the show. A reminder, you can check out Mallrats on Movies Anywhere, and it is Screen Pass eligible. So if you know someone in your life who has yet to see Mallrats, just Screen Pass your copy of it. It's that easy. Get on it, guys. We will see you next week with another episode. <laughs>